back to Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll. And before we begin today, we here at KFAI and those throughout the radio, television, and recording community around here mourn the recent death of our friend and colleague Dick Stevens. Dick was my co news co anchor at KUOM uh, at the University of Minnesota 50 years ago. And after a pretty in- illustrious career in the audio, video, and recording business, a colleague yet again sitting most recently on KFAI's board of directors and chairing our marketing committee. Dick was the consummate gentleman and professional, and his talents ran wide and deep. Great voice, too. Boy, we'll miss him. Our condolences go out to his wife, Meredith Montgomery, and their kids. So long, Dick. Most of the people we know who are caring for another person, no matter whether this caregiver is devoted family member or a slightly more detached professional, we rarely hear about the extraordinary work and, yes, loving that powers the work that keeps homebound, aging, sick, and or disabled relatives and clients as comfortable, healthy, and occupied as humanly possible. People just don't talk about such responsibilities having been laying in their laps through one or more of the physical and mental circumstances human frailty creates. It may be our wives, mothers, fathers, siblings, entering the last stages of life, stages that can stretch 10 years or more and often marked by diminished capacity or mobility or both. Or it could well be a young person with permanent disabilities that limit their full participation in this complex world of ours. I can think of several dozen of my close friends, literally, colleagues and my own extended family members who have nurtured loved ones right to the end, sometimes in hospice, often not even that, uh, and eventually, especially those afflicted with memory loss or dementia, Uh, losing their love and companionship years before they physically leave this veil. Many, but not all, of these friends and family suffer in silence and uh, even more often in a rapid descent into poverty of professional assistance or skilled nursing care as needed 24-7, 365 for many months or years. For all its nobility, personal and family caregiving is notoriously unheralded and badly underpaid. Even those considered professional aides suffer under the assumption that people who do such good works ought to just love the work and the work right into the poorhouse. Professional caregivers struggle enough, but human services professionals uh, responsible for compensating family members were until a court order reversing them a short time ago convinced that if you paid a living wage to a family caregiver they'd rip off the state and besides it's a family member after all why should they be paid to care for one of their own never mind the human and pocketbook costs that can devastate caregivers almost as much as their charges never mind the emotional and physical toll such continued concentrated care takes not just on the patient, but too often on the caregiver. So the state courts uh, unanimously agreed with caregivers when who challenged those state and c- county bureaucrats' contentions that family ca- caregivers uh, need or deserve that much less than the state is willing to pay for professional aids, and that ain't much either. Uh, finally, this year, thanks uh, to the efforts of both professionals and family personal care att- assistance, legislation authored by Senator Sandy Pappas uh, is, well, they tell me, on the cusp of uh, providing what the courts have already insisted must be done, and that is to uh, have adequate compensation and the ability to organize or unionize. After 17 hours of debate, riddled as it was by a near filibuster of well over 50 Republican amendments, <sighs> the Senate narrowly passed the bill last Friday. Uh, and, and is it any wonder, when I posted this announcement of today's show on Facebook, one conservative character with whom I uh, occasionally get in, in, involved in discussions with... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, labeled it as little more than babysitters. 
Uh, and why should we pay our babysitters or allow them to uni uh, unionize? Well, my gosh, it's hard to believe such uh, perceptions prevail in this day and age. Uh, but there you are. Uh, the House debated the bill Saturday but failed to pass it. And they uh, recessed until Sunday afternoon and they recessed again. And right up until right now, uh, this bill in the House has yet to pass. I think, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, and if you watch the tax discussion last night, uh, those Republicans, they really know how to <clears throat> block everything. Just keep asking questions. Well, all right, so we'll, we'll deal with that. But the anti-union forces, most of them Republicans, of course, and a few Democrats as well, let's, let's not forget that, have been out in force to amend this bill to death. Pretty much all because organized labor is for allowing organized, uh, allowing organizing among daycare workers and personal care attendants. That is because there's a union involved. Ooh, those terrible unions. Today we talk with personal care assistants and advocates to hear their stories while tracking the work of the legislature and from those pressing for measures to empower and professionalize the entire field. Be sure to call us with your questions and comments. The number to call to get involved in our discussion today is 612-341-0980, 612-341-0980, or tweet us at TTT Andy Driscoll, or post your questions and comments on Truth to Tell's Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash truth to tell. And we're happy to be live streaming the show today, not only for our usual KFAI.org, uh, stream of audio, but also on video as well. Craig Stelmacher is here in our studios and he's uploading the show live at livestream.com slash truth to tell. So you can watch us as well as hear us live online. And uh, later both video and audio versions will appear on our website. And Craig, mm. Craig will uh, create yeah, shorter man, man. pieces of the program mm -hmm. for yeah, YouTube. Man. Truth to tell, MN. Oh, oh, truth to tell, MN. I Craig gotcha. reminds us. All right, so the Sorry. so the live stream link as <laughs> Craig is emphatically <laughs> over here trying to tell me something. Wait, wait, wait. Push the M. Livestream.com slash truth to tell, MN, as in Minnesota. Yeah. So that's where you can watch us in case you just couldn't get enough from the audio. You can watch our ugly mugs on online too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself, lady. Right. <laughs> okay, anyway, now to our guests. Uh, first, uh, meet Connie Goldman. Uh, she's the author of several books on embracing aging, and, uh, and she has done so herself. Uh, and uh, she's a former uh, arts correspondent for National Public Radio, and now a personal caregiver in her own right. Uh, Connie, welcome back to TTT. Always a, nice to have you. It's nice to be here. Good. And we also have with us Bridget, and you're going to have to tell me how to say your last name. Siljander. Siljander. That's a great one. Bridget Siljander is a self-employed home health aide, president and chair of the Direct Support Professionals Association of Minnesota, and founder and executive director of the Youth Legacy Foundation. Welcome to you, Bridget. Thank you. Good morning. We were, looking, we were hoping to have our pal Bob Hines, who is a former newscaster here on with us, but uh, apparently um, his own personal care assistant uh, could not uh, get him freed up for this. I, at least I think so. He was going to call in. We'll see if he does. Uh, Bob, if you're out there, call in. Hey. Yeah, we miss you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have with us in studio Galen Smith. He's an organizer for the Union SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, representing direct support professionals. Galen, welcome to Truth to Tell. Hello. Glad to uh, have you. Galen's had exactly six hours of sleep uh, uh, in the last uh, 36 hours, so you have to forgive him if he falls asleep at the, uh, at the <laughs> wheel here. We have uh, also, Galen has brought with him another uh, personal care attendant, uh, young Darlene Henry. There's no question about that. Uh, how old are you, Darlene? I'm 23 years old. You're 23? <laughs> yes. You look 12, my gosh. <laughs> All right. She's a personal care attendant as well. Are you professional? Uh, P professional personal PCA? care attendant? PCA? Yes. Yeah, okay. Come right in, uh, roll yourself right into that microphone. You, there you go. 
uh, and uh, she's with us today. So we have a lot of voices, and uh, so if Heinz doesn't call in, to heck with him. There you go. <laughs> And remember, give us a call, 612-341-0980, to talk to us today about the profession of personal care giving. And um, maybe you've been a personal care assistant yourself, or maybe you have one in your family that you'd like to um, talk about exactly what it is that they do um, and why that is, you know, a real job and not just <laughs> babysitting, as some people might call it or, or think that if they haven't observed it firsthand. Right. Connie Goldman will give us uh, the perspective, at least one perspective, uh, of a family ge uh, caregiver. But Galen, you, and Bridget, and, and, and now Darlene, uh, have essentially been on the front lines of the legislative battle. So let's f just, where the heck does all of this stand, you guys? The uh, legislat uh, legislative session adjourns at midnight tonight. And uh, can can it get in, Bridget? Uh, what do you think? Talk about what this bill is and was designed to do. Why you think it's uh, important that it pass? Well, I can't speak too much about the bill, um, but I've been following it a little bit. Um, my association is union neutral, and okay. um, I've been involved with the Direct Support Professional Association of Minnesota since 2007, and this is an advocacy voice for caregivers. Um, we refer to them as direct support professionals, which is a broad umbrella term that encompasses family caregivers, personal care assistants, um, nursing assistants. Um, it, cr it covers um, across sectors. I bet a lot of the people in the audience don't realize those are all PCAs and direct support professionals. Well, I think that um, part of our challenge is defining this workforce, so that's sort of part of the task that we're charged with in our advocacy. Um, the association that I'm with is a state chapter of a national organization called the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. Mm. So there's been a lot happening around advocacy and it's just been a slowly building movement since I would say the mid 90s. Um, I'm so happy to see that there's more attention being given to these workers because it really is such a vital workforce. Um, it's really essential what we do and so actually, I, even if you're union neutral as an organization, you really are yourself, of course, a, a provider. Yes. Uh, you, you know, you're you're all sort of supporting the bill that would allow you at least to organize if necessary. Isn't that right, uh, Darlene? Have you been up at the Capitol? Yes, I have been up. You, you don't look as blurry eyed as Gail and I, but that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Um, no, yeah, I've been up at the Capitol since Saturday, and then there was Sunday, and then I was going to go back again this morning, but I have uh, to bring my mom to an appointment, so I'm trying to see what I can do about that. Well, it's nice of you to squeeze us in. Galen, <laughs> talk, now you're, you're on the front lines, really. Uh, you're, you're the union guy. Uh, you're your SEIU uh, Healthcare, isn't that right? Yeah, I am um, one of the organizers uh, at um, SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, and um, I am my my main role also as an organizer. It has been organizing. Uh, I'm also a disability rights activist um, and one of the co-founders of Adapt Minnesota, which oh, is um, a yes. direct action disability rights organization, um, and. Uh, we're a, we're a chapter of a national organization. Um, I could go on and on about ADAPT, but um, but well, my we'll role get to, at we'll SEIU... We'll get a little to ADAPT later on. My, that's fine. Right. No, that's fine. My role at SEIU has been organizing the disability community as well as working with um, other home care workers. I personally have worked as a direct support professional and a home care worker and a PCA for m much of my adult life. And... Um, um, as well as being uh, a person with learning disabilities and psych disabilities and part of the disability community. So that's where I'm coming to this from. Um, as far as where the bill is at, um, we have our bill did pass the Senate um, after um, what I'm told is the longest um, debate on any bill in Senate history, um, which was 17 hour, about 17 hours. Um, we were there all night and on Wednesday night, I think, I'm starting to lose track of days, Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then Saturday, um, the bill was taken up again um, and has been sort of debated and tabled and debated as t and tabled as they get to the budget bills. Um, and then the House is in session at 11 a.m. 
um, today. Um, they will be back in session, and i um, not sure which thing they're going to take up first, but it could be our bill um, to get back to it. Um, so, uh, and what our bill does, um, so there were two bills at the beginning of session, one that would give child care workers who receive payments from the state um, uh, to the right to form a union and one that gave um, personal care attendants and home care workers the right to form a union. Um, the legislature decided because of the similarities between those bills that they combined them into one bill. Um, and so those have moved through together. So we've been able to be in solidarity with child care workers and home care workers together ah. to make sure that we all have equal rights to form a union. Um, and so we've been out at the Capitol with those folks. Um, so we've got, uh, it's been mostly, uh, it's been ASME who's been really working um, closely with the child care workers and then SEIU Healthcare Minnesota working really closely with the home care workers. And so we've been in solidarity, the green and purple together at the Capitol. Um, uh, uh, fighting they've to been make filling sure the halls to the consternation of Republicans, I well, can tell you that. And we've had, uh, we've, we have all our little campsites staked out through the Capitol with, uh, you know, we've got our blankets and our pillows and, and uh, you know, taking cat naps here and there. I was completely asleep in the house gallery on the floor. There's like um, in the wheelchair accessible spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't have any folks using wheelchairs there at that moment, although we've had a huge turnout from the disability community around this as well. Um, and I took a nap there, I think, whatever. A couple well, nights okay, ago. so uh, <laughs> let's, um, now, now we've talked about all the perf big kinds of uh, mm -hmm. care that you can have. But let, let's zero in a little bit now on Connie, and, and I'm delighted to tell you that Bob Hines has joined us, a former co-anchor of news here at KFAI, and he is the president of the board uh, of Mature Voices, uh, which is a senior advocacy group here in the cities of Minnesota and Minnesota. Bob, welcome this morning. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning to uh, both you and uh, Michelle. Glad to have you, Bob. Yeah, glad to have you, Bob. So let's, Bob. Bob has himself is now a personal caregiver. Uh, his mother, I think, is that right? Oh no, no, no. This is uh, this is a great aunt. A great aunt. Uh, that's yes. right. That's uh, she's, right. She's uh, she's ninety five years old and will be ninety six. Oh, eight, the eighth of June. And and Connie, uh, talk about your personal caregiving, will you? Give us a rundown, a little bit about what you're doing uh, around that issue. Well, around that issue, um, I was able to, in spite of not getting much sleep last night, oops, because I'm a personal caregiver for the man that I lived with for 13 years, mm -hmm. an old friend that I hooked up with, and uh, he needs a lot of care. And uh, I was able to come here today because I was able to get somebody to come in. To, and, re re to relieve right. you, yeah. And uh, the nurse will come in uh, at, uh, in a couple of hours. And then when she leaves, then uh, someone from an agency will come in. And then I get home. And then You're I'm back a, at it. And I'm back at it again. And... I'm thankful for all the people that I can engage, and I think they should be getting paid what they need, and so that they can give me what I need and others who are caregivers, and there are plenty of us. Plenty of you, uh, personal caregivers, who are in fact sometimes also requiring at least some compensation. Isn't that not right, Bridget? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, we're talking about family members who deserve to be compensated in some way because of if sheer time, effort, and skill apply to all this. Well, I think family caregivers ought to be paid like any other caregiver. I don't think we should discriminate against someone. But they're babysitting. Because they're family. <laughs> well, I think that's another myth of the workforce. Uh, I think there are a lot of myths that we need to bust. Uh, for one, that this is unskilled work. This is incredibly complicated work. And it takes a lot of abilities and competencies to do it well, and it should be paid. And I think when we start to kind of capture, you know, sort of what goes into this job and doing it well, we'll start to place more value on it and hopefully compensation. You have a child with some disabilities of your own, isn't that right? Even though you're a professional caregiver. 
Yes, so <laughs> I'm taking care of a lot of people. Yes, you are. <laughs> so I have a daughter who's 15 who has cerebral palsy, and I've never signed her up for any services. I've um, just provided all of them myself, but um, she probably would qualify for some help. Oh. Um, but I, I know that how under-supported this workforce is, so I think it would be probably more difficult for me to rely on the help that's available than to just do it myself, which is sad, because it really compromises my ability professionally to, you know, have a full-time job while she's maybe recovering from surgeries. She's had a surgery just about every year since elementary school. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a personal caregiver for someone with multiple sclerosis, um, someone who was very active, very successful. Um, he was a fundraiser for the University of Chicago and got MS in his early 40s and is paralyzed from the neck down. From, oh my. From, and lives with his mother who's in her 90s. So, I'm, so she's his caregiver as well. And then we have aides who, well, there are two of us actually who alternate. Connie. Um, I've, I've recently come into this caregiving job but of course, when, when you hook up with someone who's older and you're older, you know that one is going to care for the other at some point. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I became very concerned about the issue of caregiving. Uh, it wasn't me personally, but everybody around me was talking about caregiving for their mother or uh, they had a disabled child or... I, and. I was at the time involved in uh, my second life career, which was um, producing public radio programs, programs for public radio broadcast on the subject of embracing aging, mm -hmm. one's own aging. And I was finding that there are many ways that your activity can help you continue to grow. I wanted to fly in the face of this aid, this idea that when you get older, you're not worth anything, and who did you used to be? Mm -hmm. and That's another overlay on all this, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And and it's uh, when I produced a radio program talking to a bunch of family caregivers, and I mean a lot of them. I mean. A couple hundred. Of oh, them. I'm astonished people, how many of my fa own family yeah, are people caregivers. who had been or were now caregivers. Yeah, and um, it, the people are always talking about the hardships and burdens. And now I can personally uh, uh, <laughs> tell you that there are many, many things you give up to do what you feel you want to do and must do at at, at the time, but. There are other things that can come for the caregiver out of the experience. And that's what I talked to a couple hundred caregivers about. Mm. People who had been or were now caregivers. About personal growth. About what they learned about themselves. and about Through, through the caregiving yeah, itself. And about how this, this job that they've taken on and would never apply for, <laughs> yes. but, but, but felt they got, well, who else is going to take care of my mother, well, of course. Well, there you, know. you are. I'm sure Heinz thinks the same way about its great eye. Sure. Ab yeah. But about what they learned about themselves and how they grew in compassion and compassion for the, their selves and, and really appreciation for what they could accomplish and how they grew as human beings. And uh, I've, I've done radio programs on that. Mm -hmm. I've written a book on that. And I'm, s you know, people talk to care family caregivers about how they can help them with the hardships. And that's terribly important. Like yeah, I good. said, I wouldn't be here this morning if I didn't have help. That's Connie Goldman, whose own career in this business has been extensive, and uh, she's telling us a little bit about it. She's a personal caregiver and an author and a speaker. And a, and so I, I, I hope that we don't overlook the, the, the uh, benefits 
to the caregiver along with the hardships. For the caregiving they have, I mean, what that does yes. for them. Yes. yes. Well, that, that is a, an important part, and there may be even some of that going on in the professional's field as well. And when we come back, I want to hear from Heinz on this, because we're both aging men. And um, and how, who, who's going to take care of yourself? Andy. I just want to take. <laughs> I want somebody to take care of me. Bob um, will do it. Okay, Bob, will you take care of me, please? Okay. Oh, uh, indeed, I will. That's indeed Bob Hines. Bob, that's Bob Hines. We also have Bridget Siljander with us, uh, and uh, Darlene Henry, and Galen Smith. All of whom, bo- all three of whom, are uh, are professional caregivers as well. Uh, in any event, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll come back and talk more about this business of personal care attendance uh, and uh, uh, direct support services of uh, professionals. And uh, there are a couple of dozen names for it. No wonder people are confused. And there you are. Uh, and we'll just t- talk about all that when we come back. Yeah, and join our conversation by calling 612-341-0980 or post your questions and comments on Truth to Tell's Facebook page or tweet us at TTT Andy Driscoll on Twitter. And we'll be back with more of this discussion right after this. Stay tuned to Truth to Tell. Well, let's get right back to our discussion around personal care providers. I wanted to jump right to you, Bob Hines, very quickly because I want to get your story a little bit. Uh, tell us what you've been up to and, and how long you've been at it and what it entails. Because, again, uh, neither of us are spring chickens anymore, buddy. Well, speak for yourself. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'll tell you, I, you know, uh, this is something that came about kind of gradually. Uh, my great aunt was pretty self-sufficient up until about uh, 10 years ago. And um, one day uh, uh, she had uh, gotten momentarily disoriented or lost en route to a hardware store, one, a place that she frequented quite often. And um, she told me uh, later that day, she said, you know, I'm going to quit driving. She made that decision on her own. So that was kind of the first step. Uh, because then I ended up, you know, say, uh, picking up prescriptions for her, things like that. And, and that's all I thought I was doing was picking up prescriptions. But somebody told me one time, no, no, you're actually uh, becoming a caregiver. And uh, mm. she used to volunteer on a regular basis at, uh, in the gift shop at the Fairview Southdale Hospital. And yes, she uh, pretty soon had some problems, uh, you know, keeping track of things, and so she ended up giving that up. So as, as she uh, uh, began to experience some of these problems of uh, aging, why then, uh, uh, as a family member, I ended up becoming uh, a, a little bit more responsible uh, and doing more things than just picking up prescriptions. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, I think one of the things that uh, people need to know about, because there have been some studies done, and that is that uh, caregiving uh, and those, uh, those of your guests there who are involved in it know that it's an extremely challenging, difficult, and tough job. I mean, it, it's one that is administered, I think, with a lot of care and a lot of, uh, and a lot of love, but it's still a very tough job. And surveys have shown that, that 63% of elder caregivers are likely to die earlier than their non-caregiving peers. And, uh, you know, that's wow. something to keep in mind. And, and, and I is. think that one of the reasons is that because stress does take a toll on, you know, on those who are, who are, providing, yes. who are providing care. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that that, that, uh, that, that statistic holds up. And, and why we're seeing the, that the professionals are hoping to be able to, uh, you know, work for better conditions and what have you. Exactly. Um, so we want to, we have a phone call, apparently. We do. We have Tom on the line who wants to talk about his experience. Hi, Tom. Good morning. Well, good morning. Say, just a little history. I'm old enough to have uh, been around, uh, heck, it would be 30 years ago now. I was a social worker in a metro county here. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, many folks that you're talking about uh, were in nursing homes, and the uh, the feds uh, allowed what was called a waiver uh, to medical assistance, which uh, allowed uh, quadriplegics, young young people, uh, in, in a large extent, mm-hmm. quadriplegics, paraplegics, 
elderly to uh, to uh, live at home as a tremendous cost saving, and, and that's what created this whole environment we're we're dealing with now. It was the alternative. Just you know, a few years ago, was nursing care. So uh, the the uh, PCAs. Uh, Needing uh, what they need to, to get by to make a living is a tremendous cost saving over the alternative, which which was nursing care. Well, and so just a little history. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. And I think uh, Tom brings up a good point. You know, we mentioned in the intro about people being worried that uh, personal caregivers might be leeching off the state or something yeah. w- regarding funding and you know my mother for worked in nursing homes for many years and was a home health aide and a hospice nurse and um and <laughs> and Excuse she's me. seen you know tons of nursing homes that have taken advantage of money from the state that is not necessarily um being used for for necessary care um and so it, it's silly to me to think that these nursing homes can charge all these all this money um, for sort of second-rate care, as we've seen in a lot of cases that are, you know, widely um, shown in the news. Uh, but then personal care assistants who are family, who have a, you know, a stake in these people, who love these people, are they're thinking that they're somehow going to cheat the system. Um, Galen, perhaps you can talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's been a big focus of sort of the disability rights movement is um, is deinstitutionalization. <laughs> that's a long word mm-hmm. to say with not much sleep, but um, the um, just the opportunity for folks with disabilities to live um, in homes that we choose and um, and get the services we need to maintain the independence that we need. And um, one of the slogans and chants of um, of adapt is. Um, well, our homes, not nursing homes, and mm-hmm. and then beyond that, when we're putting ourselves on the line and risking arrest, it's I'd rather go to jail than die in a nursing home. Are you fighting the nursing home lobby in this? Uh, generally. Oh, is that <laughs> right? Are they a big part of this? Um, well, it, adapt, it, adapt. That's been a sort of a big, um, with adapt, that has been a big a. Uh, sort of opponent uh, along the way. Um, The nursing home lobby would really like um, more of the Medicaid dollars to go to the nursing home. Um, and uh, and Instead of to the workers. Instead of, well, certainly, uh, yeah. And so at the same time... Or patients for that matter. Right. right? And and I... um, Yes, and I, I think at the same time, like SEIU Healthcare Minnesota represents workers who work in nursing homes, and as long as nursing home exists, nursing homes exist. The workers who work there deserve justice and deserve to mm-hmm. fair wages. Um, and but there's so lots of overhead that. there that's not going to those right. workers. And yeah. right, exactly. Um, and so, and we do know that um, giving people with disabilities and seniors, people who need support services, the chance to live at home is um, is is better for people. Mm-hmm. It's better for um, the people who are uh, receiving those services. People live longer. People have a better quality of life, um, and it's less expensive. Well, and you know, and I want to get to you, Bridget, because I can tell you have something to say. But it, it seems we're all here like, from Darlene Henry too. Huh? Yeah, it, it seems illogical to think that you should put someone in a nursing home where you've got two or three. Um, nurses or you know care professionals there taking care of a whole wing of people as opposed to having people at home giving individual one-on-one care um, if that is cheaper why not do that right, right. and that would that's where the nursing home lobby <laughs> comes back in <laughs> yeah, except that they want to get more and more more money not necessarily you know, as well as reducing care well Bridget you had something to say well I appreciate that the caller Bridget um, Siljander Thank you. Well, I appreciate that the caller mentioned the cost savings and that the personal care program is an alternative to institutional care. I think that we need to um, remember that, you know, this is really the best bang for our buck, supporting community-based services. Mm -hmm. Institutional care is outrageously expensive, and nobody wants to live in an institution. So and I see them die very fast, very much faster mm-hmm. uh, in institutions, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's been proven quite time and again, right? So it's a quality of life issue. It's a human rights issue. Um, also, this these issues are very much connected with poverty issues, mm-hmm. but we need to make sure that we um, provide mm-hmm. the necessary services for people to live in the community to promote their dignity and their independence. Right. And, well, and, and you were talking about how this this becomes a justice issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's talk about that a little bit, because we're all about social justice here at KFAI. We want to hear that component of this. 
uh, on this issue? Well, I think of the work of Gail direct, Smith. Yeah, that's me. Um, the uh, the work of direct support professionals as justice work, um, as part of sort of the disability rights movement. Um, and without direct support professionals and PCAs who do this work, um, there would be no movement to be having folks live at home. And so I I feel I look as look at it as justice work, um, and. Uh, and, and then also, I think just thinking about economic justice, both for people with disabilities who are um, uh, overwhelmingly poor, um, and then the people who provide those services who are also living in poverty. What about the costs? Um, and Darlene, what, did you, what do you know about the costs of providing care? And, and are, is your personal experience more sort of wrapped up in the actual physical care stuff and you're not into this stuff? Well, well no, I'm, I'm very into it, actually. My, my mother had to go after surgery into assisted living for a couple of weeks, and she was very, very upset. We had to, it, like, they really wanted her to be there because I had another job and I couldn't be there for her 24-7. Mm-hmm. And when I would come and visit her, she just had this little, like, like room that she shared with someone and she just had a curtain wrapped you know that she could like drag across and she didn't have the one-on-one care and when we got the bill a couple weeks later it was outrageous and it's like I you know I I get paid so much less than what you know it would save so much more money to keep people in their homes and like she said before it's it's you heal better in your home than you do in a strange place. And I suppose even with all the raises that uh, you could even negotiate, it still wouldn't get up to that that level of, of, yes. of outlay. <laughs> so, Bob, you had some statistics uh, in your, uh, Bob Hines, uh, yeah. your, uh, you had some statistics at your fingertips or your tongue tip or something. Uh, what? Tell us a little bit, of, do you have any more about what it actually does cost? Uh, Are you talking about costs in the in a nursing home? In nursing a, home versus that, you know, your experience at Mature Voices might tell you a well, little bit. Well, um, you know, n- nursing home costs uh, can vary a little bit, but it's extremely expensive. It can run up to you know uh, six, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a month, depending on on where a person uh, is institutionalized. Yeah. Well, and how I, much I care they need there. Yeah, yeah, and then depending on the amount of care they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, because there are assisted living facilities that, that uh, you know, would maybe be less expensive. Yeah. But one of the things I, I wanted to uh, yes. uh, touch on when you're talking about, uh, you know, I think there is definitely a place for, for nursing homes and nursing home care. But uh, I am a firm believer in... A person being able to stay in their own home, not only is it less expensive, but I think it's much, much better uh, for that individual. The quality uh, of life take, that's available take, yeah, in that setting. Yeah. yeah. You take my aunt as an example, uh, almost 96 uh, years old. She has said several times, well, maybe I should go to a nursing home. And she could afford to do that. But uh, here's, here's the problem. Uh, nobody in that nursing home is going to know her history. When uh, we're sitting around having a cup of coffee and she uh, wants to talk a little bit about her first husband who uh, was killed in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, uh, I, can, I can converse with her about, uh, about him and about you know the situation that led to his death and all of that, which is something that nobody else in a nursing home facility uh, is going to be able to do or to talk about her mother. Mm-hmm. Because... They don't know anything about the family, and uh, I think it's important that uh, you know a person is in a is in a situation or a setting where uh, you know things are a lot more like uh, just you know normal home life than it would be in an institution. I think uh, you're absolutely right, Andy, when you said you have observed that people seem to die uh, quicker when they're in institutionalized. And uh, I think that's I think that's true. I think the uh, quality of life is a, is an important issue, and that's one that I think a person uh, gets and is able to maintain to a greater degree when they're living in their own home. Yeah, no question about it. Well, you're listening to Truth to Tell. We're talking about personal care assistance, direct service professionals, uh, home health care. We're talking about this range of human endeavor called caregiving. And uh, uh, some of them are family caregivers, others are professionals, and we're talking about all of that with Connie Goldman, who is a professional, uh, well, she's a professional writer, uh, speaker, 
former correspondent uh, for NPR. She's done radio shows on the subject of aging, and now she's a caregiver herself at home uh, with her husband and uh, or partner. Uh, and uh, another great guy, by the way. Uh, Galen Smith and uh, Darlene Henry are with us on the professional side, as, as is Bridget Siljander and Bob Hines. So we'll be right back. Uh, take care. Wait, go yeah, back. Stay with us. We're back on Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll, and we are, oh, I'm Andy Driscoll. We're back on the air with uh, Truth to Tell, and we're talking about caregiving. Personal caregiving. Personal caregiving, yeah. And uh, as always, we ask you to join us uh, either by calling in or by putting your questions and comments on our social media pages on Twitter and on Facebook. And we actually have a Twitter question uh, from Thomas asking, um, to, asking us to describe in concrete terms the physical work involved in caring for a disabled person on a daily basis and we have some people here today that can personally talk about that like all of them yeah yes well, Bridget can we start with you to just talk about sure this? I think that's a great question um, I think that you know it varies based on the individual but we um, have sort of two general categories to describe the work there are the activities of daily living and there are the independent activities of daily living. So within um, the activities of daily living would be bathing and hygiene tasks, nutrition, toileting, transferring and lifting, which actually... Um, well, that is, that is uh, sometimes gets very difficult. Yes, mm -hmm. and... Do you wear back braces and things like that? Well, you can. Uh, there are... There's should? Whole, should you Well, all? you probably... <laughs> you should be very careful and you should have some training. Yes. Um, okay. to, and the state now, in the 09 legislative session, uh, required some very basic training, which is a start. Okay. There is better training available through the College of Direct Support, which is oh. online based. Um, and at the University of Minnesota. That's right. Yep. Okay. Um, or, sorry, it was the instrumental activities of daily living. Uh, I said independent, but oh, instrumental. In, uh, okay, go ahead. So there's a variety. So finish of, up those things. Yeah. There's a variety of training available out there, but the state training does cover the activities of daily living, and actually, the transferring and lifting is what makes this job one of the most dangerous in America. Yes. It's ranked very high by OSHA because of the risk of injury during transferring and lifting. My daughter used to be a CNA at a nursing home and went through a lot of that mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's actually why my mother had to quit nursing was from the back back uh, injuries from lifting. Yeah. Yep. All and, right. and sometimes carpal tunnel mm -hmm. issues from doing the care work. So um, the repeated uh, the, you know the repeated stuff gets mm -hmm. gets to you. All right go ahead. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what um, are the other so you, you said what was it called instrumental yeah. Galen. Yeah, that the policy words, the ADLs and IADLs, <laughs> and okay. instrumental activities of daily living, which is like just the day-to-day -day stuff that you need to live your life. Yeah. Just the day-to-day -day stuff you need to live your life. Yeah. yeah. And okay. the ADLs, I think, are um, chunked into seven different groups. Yeah. So I would have to... You this, could get real wonky real fast. It's, it's really quite a description then. A job description yes. would go on uh, quite a bit, uh, especially for professionals. But do personal caregivers get any of this? Well, do now they get that kind of training? There's very, very oh, limited, Darlene, there's go very ahead. limited She's training. Darlene Henry is shaking her head. Mm. <laughs> go ahead, tell us, Darlene. Well, I got the kind of training where they sent out a packet, and I read through it, <laughs> and that was my training. Oh, hello. That was, it. that was the extent of it. My mom, I've had to call the ambulance for her in the past, and so I had no CPR training or anything to prepare me for anything uh -oh. that has happened to her. So I was very, that was one of the reasons why I got started with this, because I realized, oh, there's other people out there who didn't get any training? That's not okay. Yes, okay. Connie, you had a story you wanted to tell. Well, I, first of all, I want to tell the rest of the people on this panel how much I respect what they do, because unless you have legislation, unless you have rules and regulations that train people or that compensate people that come in to help, you don't get the quality you need. But because I'm not trained in any of those things, yeah. and because what my experience has been, has been telling stories, you know, facts do illustrate, but stories illuminate. Always. <laughs> and, we like stories here. And I 
think that we can learn something about ourselves from someone else's story, someone who's so different from us, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But so I'm just going to give you a, a quick thumbnail about a story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a man's story. If you can be relatively brief, I will we're be relatively have to say goodbye fairly soon. Okay. Here. Well, I, I will be relatively. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, I just want to tell you about him. All right. He was his father was ill and living alone, and he was going to do everything. So after work, he would come over and he would clean the house and he would make the dinner. He would make his lunch for next day and then and the breakfast. Yeah. And the father would keep saying. Come and sit down with me. Come and talk with me. And he says, Dad, I don't have the time. I've got to do all this and get home to my family. And, and then one day, he says, one day I realized I was trying to fix everything. And I don't know how it happened, but I came to accept that my dad wasn't going to get well and that I couldn't fix him. And somehow I got the wisdom that maybe I should just be with him and he could be with me because he was really more important to me than washing the dishes and doing those things. He said, so I hired somebody to do that. And then I sat down and talked to my dad. And one day we went out to lunch. And one day we went out to dinner and we talked. And he told me about his family in the old country. Oh, and boy. he told me about his work and his values. And the end of the story is this. Looking at the illness, these are his words, mm -hmm. that I had damned for so long, in truth, had offered me a new experience with my dad, and without his dependence on me and my participation in his care, I might never experienced or understood what I come to learn, and I hope I never forget it. What a wonderful way to sort of begin to wrap up our program today. Thank you, Connie. That was a great well, story. Well, thank you for letting and me And how we all should all feel. I but, but, you know, when you're a professional. Go ahead. Well, and I wanted to say, you know, we've got Bob in the family who does this work on a regular basis, but also one of our former crew members, Katie DeSell, um, is also a professional personal care assistant. And um, we wanted to try to get her to call in, but it's a little too late now. But she wanted to share, you know, a lot of these stories we've been hearing today are about people taking care of members of their own family. Um, but she takes care of somebody that's not part of her family. And she said that, you know, you get to know these people very intimately, and then they become like a part of your family or, and your friends mm -hmm. um, and so that work is really important to her and really special to her. Katie's so. very close to that young man isn't yeah. she? So yeah she's they're very close friends and, and uh, you can see uh, pictures of the two of them on her Facebook yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So thank you Katie for sharing that with us. So Galen we have to wrap it up now but we yes. want to hear you said there were some uh, you can talk about how to get hold of all the yes. people and how people can participate in this thing. Well, to find out more about um, the work that PCAs are doing to form a union, you can go to our website at www.homecareworkersmn, okay. all together, all right. um, dot org. Great. Okay. And, and I have a couple of resources also. Um, the Direct Support Professional Association of Minnesota is at dspam.org. DSPAM.org. All right, we'll put, we'll also put those links right next to your name up there. Up and up. I have a few other resources. Go, okay, quickly. <laughs> okay, the NADSP.org is our national group. There's also PHINational.org. Which is? Which is another... PH... PHI used to be the Paraprofessionals Healthcare Institute. Oh, I see. He, tons of information there. Um, but there's, there's strictly also acronym now. They're an acronym, P H A I. I think I, the name might have changed, but uh, and there's also directcarealliance.org, and the College of Direct Support is at directcourseonline.com/directsupport, and that's with the U of M's Institute on Community Integration. My gosh, there's a lot out there. There really is. Uh, uh, prospects for the for the bill. Uh, come out to the Capitol uh, in an hour at 11 and come uh, join us for the session. Um, wear green or purple and uh, come fill up the galleries with us um, or watch from home. Um, as long as this bill is up, we'll be out there if you want to come join us. Um, and if you are a person with a disability who wants to learn more about connecting with folks with disabilities, you can um, you can find ADAPT uh, adapt.org or adapt minnesota on facebook thank you awesome. so much all of you for joining us today this has been just wonderful uh bob hines thanks thank you you've been great great contributor we'll talk to you soon
All right, sir. Bob, Han- Bob Hines is a personal care assistant for his great aunt. He's also president of Mature Voices, a senior advocacy group. And we also had with us Connie Goldman, who's written several books on embracing aging. She's former NPR arts correspondent and a personal caregiver herself. Connie, thank you once again for joining us. Just delighted to have you, Connie. Uh, and Bridget Siljander is a self-employed home aide, uh, president and chair of the Direct Service uh, su- Support Profe- Direct Support Professionals Association of Minnesota, founder executive director of Youth Legacy. Thanks again, Bridget, for your contribution. Thank you so much. It's been great to and have you. Galen Smith is an organizer for SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, representing direct support professionals as well. Galen, thanks to you. Thank you. And thank you, Darlene Henry, for joining us. Uh, she was a late addition. We're delighted you could you could be with us. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, the contributions of our family caregivers, personal care attendants, uh, whether or not they be family members. Uh, deserve far more attention, understanding, uh, and of course not to mention compensation in an age when home health care uh, is surging uh, and costs rise. Uh, the, they certainly deserve better than they're getting. Next week, Memorial Day, we look at a yet another new immigrant population, uh, one we know very little about, the Karen of China. And we want to remind you that Truth to Tell is a co-production of Civic Media Minnesota and KFAI. Links to audio archives of this and all of our past shows, as well as combined audio and video of past shows, are up on Truth to Tell's own website archives, truthtotell.org, as well as kfai.org. And uh, many thanks to our crew today, Mark Kerner, uh, we had uh, Ray Lynn, Ray Prokaski. Lynn yeah, Prokaski was here today, and uh, of course we always enjoy having all of those folks working around us. And Craig Stelmacher, thank and you for And Craig video Stelmacher today. behind the camera, right. We'll be back Memorial Day for the next Truth to Tell program. Until then, I'm Michelle Ali Murati. And I'm Andy Driscoll. See you next week. And uh, until then, as always, please do take care of each other. Thank you.